temperature sensors. These are some of the most common types of sensors that you will ever use. These and force sensors. So the three main types are thermocouples, thermistors, and thermometers. The thermometer is going to be either analog or digital, um, but that takes visual, it, it, visual observation to read its output. A thermocouple and a thermistor, the difference between those, and they will output a voltage in proportion to the temperature that's applied, or sometimes a, a resistance, which you can convert to a voltage. Um, the only difference between these really is um, kind of how much space you need. So the thermocouple will stick into your breadboard and measure in that small little area. The thermistor, you can put the ends of that to your microcontroller and then move the wand wherever you need to measure the temperature. So there's a little more flexibility there. Force and pressure sensors are the second most common type of sensor. And those measure force or pressure and convert it to electrical signal. So six different types of force you might need to do. Tension, compression, shear, torsional, bending force, friction force. There are lots of different sensors. Um, if you need to measure torque, those sensors are more expensive than if you need to measure a compressive force, that's probably the cheapest one. So an FSR, um, it outputs resistance that is in proportion to the amount of force applied. So this is gonna be analog signal coming out of here between zero and 255, and you will convert that between max and min pressures that it can read. Sometimes it has a linear relationship, sometimes it does not. So you'll wanna check the data sheet to see if the force resistance curve is linear or not. That way you can program the right equations. Limit switches just measure contact. So these are useful to put um, maybe like at the end of a track if you want something to stop or when if, if you're doing a retraction and you want something to stop at the other end. So the limit switch will generally be open and then once there is pressure on this part, it closes the switch. And so in that case, you would know like, oh, the object has hit it, stop going so far. So this one is digital, this one is analog. There are also other, many other types of force and pressure sensors. Um, like a scale is a type of force and pressure sensor, but these are the two cheapest and easiest to implement. You can get pretty much any of these sensors online. Amazon is a good place, or SparkFun, or DigiKey. Those are all uh, places that sell electronics stuff. Light sensors are another type of sensor, and these are kind of used to tell if something is in the way or not. So photoresistor, super cheap. These are like four cents each or something on Amazon. And its resistance decreases with increasing light intensity. So in the absence of something in front of it, then it will have a very high resistance. And then if something goes in the way to block it, it would have a very low resistance. Now, these also have a pretty short range. So you don't, like, you won't be able to, like, check and see if somebody is standing on your driveway if you're at your door, but you might be able to see within the range of, of a couple inches. They, um, there are proximity sensors that come in lots of different distances. So that's another thing that the data sheet will tell you is how, how far it sees. It usually is going to have an, it, it's going to be a range, so from a certain point of closeness to a certain point of farness is how far its, its ranges are. Other types of proximity sensors, inductive, infrared, or ultrasonic. So um, some of these are like the 
chimes that turn on when somebody goes through a doorway, those might use a proximity sensor. Uh, light curtains also are sort of a type of proximity sensor. Um, garage door, like those sensors in the garage door that won't close the door if somebody's standing in the way. Um, those are also applications of it. Now, capacitive sensors look a lot like the inductive sensor, except usually they're yellow or green instead of blue on the end. And those can detect change in capacitance if something gets close to the sensor, capacitance is going to be high, and then if it's far away, it will be low. Then the inductive sensors detect an electromagnetic field. The infrared sensors detect light and heat. And then ultrasonic sensors can detect vibration. Infrared sensors are used a lot of times for line following. Um, they can also be used because they're temperature sensitive, like in um, thermal imaging or breath analysis, and they're used in healthcare situations. But these right here are probably about a dollar each on Amazon. And ultrasonic sensors are used real commonly for obstacle avoidance. So you might recognize these from robot kits. Um, it would go kind of on the front of your robot. The car might, the car would drive around. And then if something's within the range, then you make the car stop and turn around. So that's one application of it. But these have a pretty good range. So you can see sometimes several feet with something like this. So depending on how far you need your range to be, um, an ultrasonic sensor is good for if you need to see farther, whereas an infrared or inductive sensor um, or a photoresistor, all of those need to be pretty close to the objects they're detecting. Motion detective sensors are another type of thing. And so these also will have a pretty far range. Acceleration sensors um, or inertial measurement units are a real common way to tell the direction of gravity. So you can, um, or measure acceleration in general. So an inertial measurement unit would include an accelerometer to measure acceleration and a gyroscope to measure velocity. Sometimes they can even have a magnetometer to tell direction of, or like, where are you on the earth? Or like, like if you're heading, I guess, north, south, east, and west, that, that kind of thing. A GPS would be if you needed to know your location more accurately. But an accelerometer um, works by measuring a voltage difference. So we look here, it's got a little mass on a spring and a damper. And so all of this is super tiny because it's inside of the box. And as the object that this is attached to accelerates, then the force of acceleration will push the mass one way or the other. And knowing how far away it is from like from the base, that is how it tells what the acceleration is. The output of these is generally in gravitational units. So if it has an output of one, that would be one G but the data sheet will tell you conversion factors. This one is a three axis accelerometer. You can see it has X, Y, Z. So when you mount one of these, you'll want to know which direction you put it or have all of your accelerometers pointing in the same direction so that you will be able to read the output and know how that corresponds to the actual orientation of the device. Tilt sensors are the digital, or I guess like the discrete version compared to the analog. Um, whereas the accelerometer would be analog, the tilt sensor is just going to be digital. So the tilt sensor has, it's got these two leads that stick inside of here and it's got a little metal ball inside. So when the sensor is right side up, the ball is touching these two leads and 
it makes contact. Then when the sensor tilts upside down, the ball leaves and there's no contact. So that's how it's either on or off. Um, so you won't really be able to tell what angle something is at. You'll just be able to know if it's right side up or upside down. Color sensors are used for just detecting the color of objects. So if you need to sort something by color, or um, if you need to maybe um, navigate certain uh, a maze, or say you have cars that need to make deliveries from one point to another point, and they have to follow tracks where each, like a track for each certain activity might be a different color, you could use a color sensor. But mostly they're used for sorting operations. Magnetic field sensors, a Hall effect sensor is one type of this, which is used in a tachometer. So there would be a little metal piece on the wheel that goes around and then the sensors mount it statically. And every time that the metal piece on the wheel passes the sensor, it can count one tick. So this is how you might measure velocity of a wheel. And you could even put, if you needed higher resolution, you could put more little metal pieces on the wheel that that way you could tell like every time the wheel made a half revolution or a quarter revolution or whatever. Humidity sensors, if you need to know moisture in the air or sometimes in the soil. So something like this you might use in an automated watering system where you want to tell if the soil was dry or wet, whether or not you should put in water. Also, they're used in HVAC systems, so if you need to extract moisture out of the air to a certain level, you could use something like this. In HVAC systems in buildings, a lot of times they will take the air in and then cool it down to like 65 degrees or something to get all of the humidity out and then heat it back up to whatever temperature people need it in their rooms. So that's one reason that big buildings are often really cold is that it's easier, it, it's actually cheaper to keep it cold than to keep it hot because they have to get the air that cold anyway at first. 